using a few older components to make a great bang for buck PC. On this channel, I recently took a spin with an older 11th gen Intel box and the folks at Geekcom were like, hey, we think we got an AMD system that can beat it. And I was totally game. They sent over an A5 mini PC for me to take on a spin, share some thoughts, and it's an interesting data point to look back on some older components and see how they stack up in these little mini consumer systems. If you're a PC enthusiast, you already know how this generation of Ryzen performs, but two and a half years after its initial launch, what we can talk about now is a price to performance for consumers. And what's encouraging is seeing how many affordable systems are out there, which are solid overkill for daily driving computer tasks and are starting to drive better multimedia content creation, and gaming conversations. The A5 here is immediately familiar to fans of mini PCs. It reminds me a lot of that classic Intel Nook design. This is one of the easiest form factors available to buy a computer, plug it into a monitor, and still have a somewhat upgradable machine. Unlike the older Intel Nook line, these are not bare bones computers. They have RAM and storage included for the price with a copy of Windows 11 pre-installed. It's a teensy little box, but it's packed with ports. And this generation of hardware helped transition us to some better I.O. More consistently, we're getting things like USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports, and both of the rear USB-C ports support video out, clearly marked with display port labels. The front USB-A is a power pass-through port, charges your phone even when the PC is off. The rear HDMI ports are HDMI 2.0B, capable of either 8K video output, or you can connect up to four 4K displays from these rear options. We still have a headphone jack and a memory card reader, options that should still be on our phones. And it's really nice to see a 2.5 gig ethernet port. So we're doing better than gigabit ethernet here, which is great for folks upgrading their home network like I did with my little NAS and my 10 gigabit switch. Just four screws in the bottom feet, open this up, give us full access to the RAM and storage. <laughs> Let me just switch hands here before I drop this. An M.2 drive is installed. My review unit came with 32 gigabytes of RAM in a 2x16 configuration, and the bottom tray can hold a SATA SSD. Now there's another M.2 slot here, which looks like it could fit a 2242 SSD, but there's no literature on this from the Geekcom instructions or online. The spec sheet only lists the 2280 slot, which is occupied, and the website teardown image erroneously mentions two 2280 slots. That's incorrect. Even without the second M.2 though, it'd be really easy to pack this with a goodly amount of storage to build a little mini server. And with that ethernet port, you'd have better cable networking to move files on a faster network. Put this back together now, Bluetooth 5.2, Wi-Fi 6 included. It really is a little champ of a box and it's really easy to work on. Plus, Geekom includes the bracket for you to mount this to your monitor for a quick and easy all-in-one style desktop PC. The main Achilles heel is the fan noise. There is constant air moving through this frame as soon as you turn it on. And sustaining any activity will likely result in this. You probably won't want to keep it right in front of you on your desk, which is why it's handy being able to mount this behind your monitor. Because performance is the fun part of this conversation. Now, I don't run comprehensive benchmarks, but I do like to compare a couple data points. Now, I like to talk about how phones and tablets can replace laptops and desktops. But since the launch of the M1 Mac Mini, we've seen some significant generational uplifts in these mini boxes, packing x86 hardware. Outside some Geekbench scores, we see some massive improvements in tasks like file compression. Out to around a 9th or 10th gen Intel system, current smartphones could compare. But arriving at this AMD 5800H, this is now roughly three times faster than the fastest ARM SoC I've tested in Android or in Windows land. Conversely, my little video editing test shows improvements over similarly priced Intel boxes, but this is an area where light video editing might still be better done from a phone. Where prices might be close to an 11th gen Intel Core i7, this AMD machine can edge out the PCI last tested for both CPU and GPU rendering. I believe a 12th gen Core i7 would likely take a small step ahead, but then we're seeing prices climb 
higher. As I'm primarily a phone reviewer on this channel, I feel I should point out that a Pixel 7 Pro can recreate this DaVinci Resolve project in LumaFusion and render it at a similar quality more than twice as fast as the GPU render here from AMD. Moving on to gaming, and this is the biggest difference I've encountered yet between AMD and Intel mini PCs. Games are far more playable on Vega 8 graphics than Intel's older integrated graphics. A little more than a year ago, mini PCs at around the $400 price point struggled to keep up with 720p gaming. And recently, the Intel machine I tested could start to bump up to 1080p gaming for a few arcadey games. The A5 here is starting to scratch at proper support for older AAA titles. First, the arcadey stuff, because I really play a lot of these games. No issues at all tackling my favorite low power requirement games. Dead Cells, Shredder's Revenge, and Vampire Survivors, all perfectly presented and pegged at high frame rates. Really great just seeing that you can go straight to 4K resolution on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles table stakes. But things get more interesting when we move over to games like Tetris Effect, which can be deceptively resource heavy. Here, we get a really nice choice for performance. We can dial down all the graphic settings and play in 4K, or we can turn on all the eye candy and play at 1080p, but both are gonna give us 60 FPS. Now it's cool that we can play in 4K with the eye candy on and still float around 30 to 40 frames per second, but it's Tetris, so you kinda want the smoothest animations you can get. Now I also like testing with Hellblade, and until now no inexpensive box has really handled this game well. If we just go with native rendering, we can edge out the Intel machines of this generation, but not by much. 1080p at frame rates in the mid-teens, just walking around the intro level. Something I haven't tested a lot on these machines though, FSR. And this looks really good, enabling a playable 30 frames per second with higher fidelity images than I was expecting. So usually for these less expensive boxes, I often stop here. It's not worth going much further, but I was curious to see if we could get any playable settings for control. And not really. Like, it's funny, at max resolution and highest graphic settings, this box can put out four frames per second, but tweaking settings and dropping resolution, the game is still mostly unplayable, but we can almost get there. You just don't want to be fielding a combat situation at 20 frames per second. But that is fun considering the age of this hardware, because that's where this box makes its biggest case for its existence. It's not just performance in a vacuum. We know what this generation of AMD can do, but performance per price, that's key. We're a fully built mini PC with 512 gig of storage and 32 gigabytes of RAM with Windows 11 installed is selling for around $399. The list price is closer to 600, and I don't think you should buy it for 600. We just had the same conversations around 11th gen Intel Core i7s and 12th gen Intel Core i5s, but near that ballpark, this AMD 5800H is outperforming both. And that price is critical because we swing significantly when a few of the components change. Like moving up to a 5900HX, Geekom is gonna charge you $200 more for the uptick in performance. And, and also it includes a full-sized display port Port. In mostly CPU bound tasks, we're looking at maybe a 10% difference in real world performance. That's not a bad price for the 5900HX, it's just we can get a 5800H for a really good price. I'm not trying to play chipset historian. I feel there are probably some techies online that can do that job better than I can, but I feel the 5800H was a critical chip for AMD, though it draws more power at peak performance than an Apple M1. And that makes the laptop conversation a little trickier. You might not be as concerned about that on a mini desktop. The fan noise could be a bit troublesome for some folks, but the AMD is often capable of outperforming the M1 Mac Mini of a similar generation. And you have options to upgrade RAM and storage far beyond what Apple will allow you to do with a Mac. M1 Mac Mini used with the same 512 gigs of storage will be more expensive, and getting a certified refurb 
will cost more than that. For less than the price of a Mac Mini refurb, you could get this and double the RAM. And if you were able to spend $50 more than the Mac Mini refurb, you could also drop in a two terabyte SATA drive on top of the built-in 512 gig SSD. Mini PC pricing is getting kind of crazy. A number of manufacturers are playing with tech that fell in price sharply over the last two years. And especially in the window between $300 and $500, an entire chipset generation might represent a $50 price difference. It's stunning what $399 can buy you these days. And this right here is sweet, delicious overkill compared to what we used to sell as a low-cost family or student computer. is really good stuff, so I will, of course, throw a link down in the description below for more information on Geekom PCs and where you can shop them online. It's also Geekom's 20th anniversary, so I'd imagine there are probably some decent sales happening if you catch this video close to the time that I published it. They also sent along a gift box that will be available to folks who buy through their site. We got some fun perks in here to add on to your PC purchase. So happy birthday, Geekom. You are almost legally allowed to buy alcohol in the United States. So as always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos and subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been amazing. If you're clicking on links or if you're visiting my home site, somegadgetguide.com, or if you're joining the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, that's patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list represents the coolest tech pals in the universe. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet, basically everywhere as at some gadget guy that you can post socially, but I'm spending a bit more of my time these days on the Mastodons, a little less so on the Facebooks and the Instagrams and the Twitters, but I will catch you all on the next review.